Okay, well, maybe it's about time she should write a few words. All right. <laughs> well, I think it's probably best to maintain the flow, and then we can all talk, talk over coffee. And you may not be surprised to hear that I haven't prepared a PowerPoint presentation because I hadn't a clue, I hadn't an inkling. How can we listen to that? Oh, ah. what is <laughs> going to happen? You're going to have to listen to me as opposed to look at the <laughs> um, And it's going to be a bit of a free flow. But, um, you know, we all fessed up a bit uh, about ourselves. Uh, where am I from? Uh, I was an elite. I was 36 years in the Royal Navy and I got to be an admiral. Whoa. Um, I was also a third class citizen, citizen within that elite, interestingly. Um, I was a supply and secretariat officer, so I was the gopher. I was kept around everywhere, your language. Um, I, had, I, I ended up heading up my branch of 4,000 people, and uh, the language of despair was all over the place, handicapped, sidelined, degraded, de-skilled. Um, nobody recognised them for their skills. So I had a little strategy when I was about halfway through my career at the rank of captain. I decided that we, we were on an un unsustainable pathway in terms of staffing a future Royal Navy. It just wasn't going to work the way it was. So um, I proposed a solution. It wasn't the final solution, but it was a solution. Uh, and it said, rather than having three um, classes of officer, warfare, engineering, and third class go for supply and secretariat. Um, let's just have two, warfare and support. Well, this created absolute chaos. But what I did was uh, to achieve my objective of um, building up the two of the four R's. And those two were recognition and respect. Mm -hmm. and what I'm telling you here is I actually achieved a logistics branch, which is precisely what I wanted. That has recognition, that has respect. It sounds so much better than supply and secretariat, doesn't it? And it means you do something. So actions speak louder than words. And um, the SAS, um, you know the motto of the SAS because I've seen you use it in presentations. Who dares wins? But you only dare if you've got the confidence to go forward. So what is the BOA doing? The BOA is very conscious that we are completely unrepresentative of a huge segment of the surgical TMO community. I mean, I thought there were 2,000, I had no idea there were 3,000, but then nobody can tell us uh, how many there are. We have a shrewd idea for NHS England, because working with Mamdu, we can get um, some data through the deaneries, but it's not comprehensive. When uh, we talked about TMO numbers for surgeons with the Centre for Workforce Intelligence. They didn't even take into account the SAS. Mm. That, that didn't feature in, in the assumptions. Uh, and even then we know that demand for the surgery that you deliver is outstripping the nation's capability to deliver it. So we, we do have a little problem. Um, I've been over this for, uh, all over this for a number of years, actually, Shinoda, and I think you're aware of that. I mean, it was back in Peter Kay's day in 2011 when he was president. I was very much looking forward to coming to the annual Boza conference to present our strategy for the BOA based on three strands, professional practice, training, education, and research, and to work out how we weave the SAS in an inclusive way into our strategy. That, unfortunately, didn't come to anything, and um, other things took over. Uh, and then Mamdu came to us, funnily enough, having been appointed associate dean for uh, the West Midlands Deanery, um, with some ideas, mainly revolving around training and education. But since then, we've published on getting it right first time. Getting it right, right first time is going to reshape the practice of trauma and orthopedics in England, certainly, and it will be emulated in Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Why? because everybody is going to have to come together with their individual <coughs> results from the registry, and there are more registries coming on stream, so just about every single interventional procedure in TNO will be covered by a registry, pull their results so that the unit, each unit, can take a collective view of the individual results and the totality so that the unit can take a decision on how to shape its practice going forwards. That now comes under the auspices of the BOA's Professional Practice Committee, is there an SAS surgeon on the Professional Practice Committee? Answer, no. Will there be? Answer, yes. We will move to a point one. The trauma group has been looking at the reconfiguration of trauma and how best we practice trauma 
in the UK since the reconfiguration. We did all of that work through our surgeons in the Department of Health and NHS England in particular. Is there an SAS surgeon on the trauma group? No. Will there be? Yes. We will appoint one. Um, those decisions taken in the last two weeks, as it happens. Why? Well, you've been an agent provocateur, no doubt about it, and you're very good at it. Um, but also because there's a growing awareness. We can't just walk away from this issue as a professional body. We have a responsibility as a professional body to look after our members or our surgeons who come within the ambit of the profession, as all of you do. So there's no walking away from this. There's no ostrich with a head in the sand business. That can't go on any longer. And the numbers speak for themselves. There are 3,000 orthopedic SAS surgeons. We don't know what they're doing. That is a scandal. It's a scandal for the profession. I acknowledge that. And it's a scandal for the nation. So we need a strategy for the SAS. We've got the bones of it, man, haven't we, in terms of training and education. We need to weave more into the professional practice side of the house. We need to understand where the SAS sit in trauma and orthopedic workforce planning. We do an awful lot of evidence-based workforce planning for the national selection to ST3 through the SAC, but that's done by the BOA now with the SAC, before it wasn't. Um, and we use the evidence base through getting it right first time dashboards as it happens to help to fill our knowledge gaps there. But we need more transparency of what SAS surgeons actually do. I'm brutally aware that half, you know, it's 1.5 million plus and counting um, joint reg joints registered on the NJR. Um, how many have we got? I don't know. And who are they credited to? Well, not credited to you, I don't think. I think I'm right in saying. I don't think that's right in an era of transparency. So we have the transparency agenda on our side. We've got the quality outcomes framework on our side. We've got um, actually right on our side uh, in, in the four hours. You can play these any way you want, actually. It's important to do it. Four hours is very easy. Right recognition, res responsibility, and respect. I love it. Um, and we can keep playing that tune. But I need you to work with me. I can't do it on my own. Mamdu can do some of this with me. Um, but we need a better cohort of thinking people who can come together, help us create a strategy document that will enable us to work out what we need to consider for our SAS surgeons in trauma and orthopedics across the three components of our strategy, excellence in professional practice, training and education, and research. And research is going to improve now because <coughs> I haven't put an SAS surgeon on the research committee either, and we can probably achieve that. But with the inception of the British Orthopaedic uh, Surgical Research Centre based on the York Trials Unit uh, in, in York University, as we improve our methodological support to major trial applications as opposed to lots, lots of little pump priming basic science projects, so we should be able to put more flesh on the bones there. So that's the proposition. Mandu represents the SAS now on council. Um, it seemed a logical thing to do. It's, it really is conversion with the SAS Charter. Um, I'm not a great fan of documents. I, I see about 50 policy documents from an NHS England every month and more consultations than you can shake a stick at. So there's enough paper floating around the NHS to, to, to uh, fell 14 rainforests. Um, and not a lot of it's doing very much. And I learned something from Tim Briggs is you actually get down, knuckle into it and do something. We can do something. But Rome wasn't built in a day. Yes, we can have more SAS involvement in the Congress. Why has it not happened already through the specialist societies? Answer, don't know. How do we do that? We need to crack that nut. There is a Caesar session running on, on Friday. It's well supported. I've been to other Caesar sessions. One was Professor Simon Frostick run, uh, ran uh, for the IOS UK meeting in this very convention center back in June. Um, I would say something about the GMC here. They support those sessions very well, and they provide very good insights into how to crack a season. And I think I'm right in saying there's about 1,800 pages of evidence that have to go into the thing. It sounds appalling from my perspective, but there's a reason for that. Um, and no, it's not for the faint-hearted. 
Uh, but, you know, it wasn't for the faint-hearted for me when I was a third-class citizen in the elite of the Navy and became the first ever non-warfare officer director of the Naval Staff. These things can be done. And my peers didn't like it, but they respected me after they saw I could do the job. So these things can be cracked. So my proposition to you is, I know and I understand the depth of frustration. I know what it feels like to be not quite up there in other people's perceptions. Um, I hate being kicked around myself and being feel, feeling to be, de be just feeling degraded. Um, yes, the BOA is the godfather. Who used that expression? I rather like that. But we're not paternalistic. <laughs> and we're certainly not Mafia. Um, but our role is to support you going forwards, but we have to do that together. So, at the risk of saying something that will also get me shot at door, I would, my strong advice to you as a collective is to rein back on the understandable frustration and the expressions of frustration, because bizarrely, you may not be surprised to hear that they can be counterproductive. Mm. Um, and to go forward as we do with babies, positive reinforcement, um, and that's what we want, positive reinforcement surrounding the SAS community so that as with babies the consultants get to understand this. You're not trying to undermine them, nobody's trying to undermine anybody here. We're trying to create something good and enduring out of something that at the moment is clearly unsustainable and illogical and wrong. So we need to make it right. Um, another four hours coming into play. That is what needs to be done. How do we do it? Um, Ma'am, do you and I need a chat about that? And I think we'll talk more about this at the session tomorrow. But my strong advice to you is, um, and we, you and I are having supper with the GMC chair tonight, um, Shaluda we have an opportunity here to influence at the, the highest level in a very structured and objective way. Um, so I would see a document. I also want to see the consultant advisory book produced by the PPC change to the surgeon's advisory book so that we don't perpetuate the primacy of consultants in, in that way. Um, and that should be entirely possible. And we can put into that a good section on SAS issues that, that covers off almost the entirety uh, of uh, an SAS contemporary SAS surgeons TNO comprehensive practice. We talk about so just in the view of council have a good medical practice about the SAS surgeon. Well, we'll put it into the consultant's advisory book. Yeah, we can we can make a separate thing. Yeah. But but, but I would like to be all inclusive rather than. We so have one for the consultants and one for the SAS surgeons, because that actually is perpetuating a, a perception that I think is unhelpful. Yeah? yeah so the breadth of the church needs to be acknowledged, uh, and we need to, I'm sorry, I'm using lots of metaphors, but, but, but the, these, these, are, these are sensitive and difficult issues. I'm convinced that we can do this. Um, yes. I know the BOA, the senior BOA leadership is convinced we can do this. Why is Colin Howey, our president, chairing tomorrow's session precisely because he's convinced we can do this and he wants to do this. You have to forgive people if they use the wrong name sometimes. It's very confusing. We talk generically now about the SAS because that seems to be the most convenient expression. I completely agree that you can't be a non-anything by, by title. That, that means that totally, well, it's illogical, degrading and all, and all the other things. So we're agreed it's the SAS, aren't we? Yeah. Good. Because that's how I would like us to go forward. And we can talk about this in terms of the specifics, because I can't possibly address every point that was made by colleagues this afternoon um, with varying degrees of uh, feeling, vehemence, and everything else. Uh, totally understandable. Just to say, coffee is ready one, by the But uh, also, want to comment. I believe if you want a car, get the blooming car and use it. If you want Caesar, just do the usual, the proper way of going to the Caesar and be an SPR. And in my opinion,
people who come to SAS and then want to become in the Caesar category, it's a very hard and difficult way. That's my uh, take. You are playing by the rules, I respect it. If you want to play football, just play football. Don't go around. Oh. By the time the process came in, which was obviously 2000 and early 2000s, uh, and you would have been in the middle, of, you would have been practicing fairly independently within a particular area for quite a long time. The process was n never ever going to work for somebody in, a, in, in group one in Shalida's slide, which uh, yeah, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to guess which groups each one of you belong to. But it, group one here. It's a, it's, it's a process. Group, group one, uh, group one here. Uh, a, pro a process that really, I suspect, was never designed to never would work for the majority of people in Group 1. I worked for close on 20 years with a, an Indian doctor who uh, was a, an associate specialist with us. He had worked with the senior consultant until I came along and replaced the senior consultant. And I'll be honest, it was an extremely difficult because I'd never worked with anybody like that before. I was his boss, but he was older than me. He was in many ways more experienced than me. And it was, it took quite a while to, to manage that relationship. And we, as a department, sort of managed it and uh, it took time. And the other was a political refugee from Saddam Hussein who, uh, very different people, very different sets of skills, and that's the fundamental problem. The, the first one never had an FRCS of the old type, not let alone the new type, and yet you would quite happily let him do a hip replacement. The other one had an FRCS, but uh, um, wasn't quite as technically uh, gifted. That's the fundamental problem, and you know, I, I hope I'm showing that I do have a real understanding of the issues, a feel for the issues. I don't know that I necessarily know what the solutions would be. I, well, I, I don't think there's a quick, I mean, I think some of the things that Mike suggested will be, you know, <coughs> good for keeping things together at the moment. I personally think the long-term solution, I would like to say, no disrespect to anybody in this room is we should say, look, no more entry into the grade. We replay, as people retire, die, shuffle off, whatever, they get replaced by fully trained doctors and uh, you train enough people to fill that so that we won't have this problem, that all the problems that you have, which I understand and agree with, because the reason that you exist is because some of my colleagues are lazy. Well, that needs a proper service yeah, analysis. Do I leave now? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, sorry, I wanted to finish what I started. Sorry. What mm -hmm. DOA in 2004 with David Dandy, etc. We started this organization, myself and three other colleagues, to promote ourselves. Uh, it, it became the chicken and the egg situation in BOA and the BOSA. Ourselves, partly faulty, including myself, that we could not get ourselves as a proper organization of long lasting. We tried very, very long, but we. Okay, now I'll give you an observation on that. Yeah. When I arrived in 2010, the BOA was not organized. I'm sorry, it wasn't. It, it shouted loudly from the sidelines uh, and got upset when nobody listened. And we quickly stopped doing that. Uh, and our approach became one of identifying issues, the problems that sat beneath those issues, and what we needed to do about those problems, and the resources that we needed in order to solve the problems. And we took the problems to NHS England, and got them to pay for us to solve them. That's what we do now, and uh, we won't solve the problems of the SAS community all on our own, but we can highlight them. We can identify how they need to be addressed, what the solutions could possibly be. 
And we have to work with the system to do these things. That I do know. Too much shouting doesn't get you anywhere. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that we've matured. Yeah. And we're much better now at doing these things. Sorry. And I'm a great respecter uh, of David Dandy. Well, Mr. Clark, you mentioned two things. One, one of the things is training. OK, we are considered as non-trained. OK, I, don't, I think every one of us doing our patient disagree with you, and also your SPR, we train them. OK, we are surgeons. The thing is, it's not the training. It's what you call training. It, it's actually like an old gladiator. Gladiator can fight, whatever. They are gladiators because they are slaves. Some of them buy the freedom. Some of them don't. So it's what you, what you call. You labor, you give us a rubber stamp. Another point you mentioned about European law. You said, that, okay, this is the European is according to European law. That's fine. But also, if you are going to the law, either in this country or European law, what is happening is discrimination. And if we don't want to go down this route, because us as SS, we can go all the way, because it, it's not frustrating. Okay, we want to work with, for the benefit of the, for the health of the nation, for everybody, who is everyone. But to see the duality, I think no one will buy it. And I'm saying, not for us, it's for everyone. Let's work together and sort it out. That's all. Well, let's go and get a cup of coffee. Can, can I say something before, before, before we go? First, we need to say, my our chief executive David is a teacher and Ahmed thank you very much for coming and thank you very much. I, I'd like to say one comment I say we have two thousand, three thousand, <coughs> only minor number of these will go for Caesar, I would say hundred maybe. So what are we going to do with the with the next with the rest of it? I think there's a lot of negative has been said that and I don't like negative, we like positive. Where we go, we can keep whinging and angry for time and time. I think person probably I said that last week. We probably need to look at these 2,000 people who stay in this grade. We need some development for them. Not a training, some development program, some assessment to be different from training, how to do it. Someone doing hips or knees. Okay, how can you develop in this area? I don't want you to do spinal degenerative. I don't want you to go to see that you're doing a good job. And I learned when I did some work in the dinner that the psychiatric degree, they do something called certified psych psychiatric. So we can have a certified or specific surgeon, not on a special register, like credential or something like that. Maybe <coughs> political well, I'll mention credentialing tomorrow. Yeah, but, uh, yeah we mentioned credential. It's but, a work in progress. Well, I think what we need positive from BOA, how to develop these people in this area. We yeah. might need to go on each trust, and so all the clinical directors, this doctor, what's he doing, how do you develop them individually? And what, what's happened to and the how service? How do you use them in the service? There? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you have to be yeah. proud, you're an SS doctor. You're doing a good job in that. Yeah. You do hips and knees, that's enough. I'm not asking you to do shoulder. But let's develop this shaft in this area. And that will be satisfaction, respect, and recognition. So let's have positive what you do. But don't put everything negative, because I think it's too much negative in this session. Ahmed, yes. Can I just say that you're absolutely right. Credentialing is. In, in front of the GMC, the document's out for yes, consultation, yes, yes, yes. and we are responding to that, and everybody here can respond to that because it will apply to everybody. Surveyor, if it comes, it will be BOA that will be handing out the credentials, and that's when your work with yes. the BOA will be exactly. very, very important. But we need to develop and them, give them an opportunity, how yeah. to develop. If someone hadn't been credentialed... The only to, other thing I noticed say, the GMC wasn't going to pay us to do that, were they? Correct. <laughs> but we'll change that. We'll change that. Just and we cannot, we cannot close the doors on 20% yes. of the secondary yeah, care no, workforce. No. I just, uh, just at the last meeting, the EBOT exam traditionally has been a written paper and orals. It will be a written paper, clinicals and orals. Everyone in Europe, apart from the Germans, have signed up to that. Germany can't sign up to it because it's too regionalized, the way that uh, training goes. And that's gone to the European Parliament for approval. So in future, the exam will be very, very similar, the EBOT exam, to what we currently have here. And the presidents of the four colleges of the United Kingdom have agreed that there should be an international exam. And that international exam will be based, again, entirely on the way that the intercollegiate exam happens. 
and that's true of ENT as well. I don't know about the EBOT ENT side of things. So there are things happening to try and regularise and maintain standards. So they are fairly constant across Europe and across the wider world as well. That may make it easier, of course, for people to move with a degree of regularity in their qualifications. But I think the most important thing that really the 15 of you, you know, the gang of 15, whatever you want to call yourself, <laughs> they would be to produce a register of who are the relevant people that should be involved and to, encouraging the, and to encourage them to attend such, you know, this sort of place this sort of thing, and then you are in a much better position to... Well, we'll definitely work on that. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for thank inviting you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.